Dogs Don't Tell Jokes by Louis Sacher, 21. How could I think that was funny? Gary asked as he went over his routine. He shook his head in disbelief. The jokes he used to think were great now didn't seem funny at all, especially the ones he had made up yesterday. He decided two of the new jokes were kind of funny. He threw away the other three. A bad joke is like a rotten fish, he decided. You don't know it's bad until the next day when it starts to stink. He laughed. That's good. That's funny. I don't think I can use it for my routine, but it's still funny. Suddenly, out of nowhere, he remembered one of the other jokes he had decided not to use. It was funny. Why didn't I think it was funny yesterday? He wondered what made him suddenly remember it. For that matter, he wondered how he ever thought up any of his jokes in the first place. Bang! Gary flung himself on his bed, as if a bomb had exploded in his room or in his head. He rolled over, looked up at the ceiling, and whispered, Perfect! He had come up with the big finish for his act. There was just one question. Would he have the guts to do it? Sure, why not? He meant he'd and then he'd have to recognize his whole routine. And then he'd have to reorganize his whole routine to make the ending work just right. He'd have to change the beginning and the middle to fit the ending and have the whole thing memorized by tomorrow night. He hoped the thrift store still had the hat. If not, he could always use one of his other hats. But the one at the thrift store was better because it was a little too tight. He'd need help, too. His parents wouldn't help him, that was sure. And he didn't, he didn't dare tell his parents. Before he changed his mind... He went to the kitchen and called Gus on the telephone. Then he called the thrift store and told the woman to save the hat for him. He'd pick it up tomorrow on the way home from school. Gary went through his routine from beginning to end. For the third time, it was still too choppy. He needed to be, it needed to be smoother. The timing was all wrong. He set his notes aside and tried doing it from memory. He was surprised by how much he had memorized. He only had to look at his notes a couple of times. Then he went through it again, and this time he didn't have to look at his notes at all. He sighed in disgust. Sounds like I'm reciting the Gettysburg Address or something. He didn't want to sound like it to sound like he was reciting something he had. He didn't want it to sound like he was reciting something he had memorized. It had to sound natural, like he was making it up as he went along. Okay, one more time. Timing was the most important thing. He didn't want to pause too long or too short. The pause had to be perfect. The pause was all important, or was it? Should he pause at all? When? How long? Why? Ah! He shouted. He stared at his blank walls. He didn't know. He just didn't know. He had gone over the joke so many times, he didn't even know what was a joke and what wasn't. There was a knock at his door. What? He shouted. His mother peeked around the door. I know you said you didn't want to be disturbed for anything. He glared at her. Actually, he was grateful for the interruption, but he didn't let on. Angeline's on the phone, his mother said. She said it was urgent. Do you want me to tell her to call, he'll call her back? No, I'll talk to her, said Gary. Gary's mother seemed a little insulted that while she, his own mother, wasn't allowed to interrupt her, he was perfectly willing to leave his room to talk to Angeline. He took the call in the kitchen. Maybe Angeline get to come to the talent show after all. Hi, what's up? Angeline came straight to the point. Don't do your act in the show tomorrow. What? Something terrible is going to happen, she said. A disaster. Ah, oh, come on, said Gary. I know my jokes may not be funny, but no one's ever called them a disaster. Ha ha. Angeline didn't laugh. I'm serious, Gary. I started feeling it right after dinner, and then I started crying and couldn't stop. I can still feel it. Gary could hear her fighting back tears now. Please don't do it, she begged. Just quit the talent show. Why, what's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know, said Angeline. I've never felt something like this before. Are you sure it's bad, he asked. If you've never felt anything like it before, then how do you know it will be a disaster? I know, said Angeline. If you break your leg, you don't need a doctor to tell you you can't walk. Gary took a breath. It's all memorized, he said. They stayed on the line for another minute or so without speaking. Then each said goodbye. Gary gently hung up the phone. He took a breath and turned to see Mrs. Snitsbury in her green pajamas sitting cross-legged on the counter between the sink and the stove. Who was that? Mrs. Snitsbury asked Gary. Angeline, he said Gary. What did she want? Gary thought a moment. Nothing, he murmured. Who are you talking to? asked Gary's father. Startled, Gary turned. He hadn't noticed his father reading the paper in the, at the kitchen counter. He looked back at, Mr. Snits, at Mrs. Snitsbury, who slowly faded away before his eyes. Nobody, he said. There was still time to quit. There was always time to quit. Right up to the last minute. He didn't have to tell anyone he was quitting, just not show up. Well, if it's a disaster, then it's a disaster, said Gary as he walked across the schoolyard. Like Mrs. Longleg said, I can't keep signing up and quitting and signing up and quitting. Besides, I already called Gus. If it's a disaster, then it's a disaster, he said again. There's nothing I can do about it. Besides, how bad can it be? And that's the end of chapter 21.